So, I read a really interesting letter in the Powell Tribune the other day. Listen to this. At least for my own personal part, I like this wide open country. Whenever I see the hills around here, I am always reminded of that cowboy song, The Hills of Old Wyoming. Little did I realize a few years back when that song flashed on the screen of the neighborhood theater in Los Angeles, that we would someday be going there to live. We get the impression of the typical Western hospitality and friendliness of the people. We residents of Heart Mountain, both the first generation Japanese and the second generation American citizens of Japanese descent, want you to know that we too are men of goodwill with goodwill in our hearts toward our other fellow Americans. If you doubt it, we ask you to come and become acquainted with us, seeing is believing. We will meet you more than halfway. You know, that is a lady who has something to say. Hello, and welcome to Notable Women of Heart Mountain. This is the last of the Heart Mountain Winter Program series, and it is also, due to current events, part of our new online programming initiative. My name is Callie Stusi, and thank you for joining me. In honor of Women's History Month, today we are going to be looking at three remarkable women who were incarcerated here at Heart Mountain during World War II. The incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II helped a lot of people realize the importance of going out and challenging stereotypes. These three women refused to be confined to simple concepts of either gender or race. And in the process, they, they became important leaders, not just of the Japanese Americans, but within the American community as a whole. So, to start off, a bit of historical context for those of you who maybe are joining us for the first time. In 1941, the Japanese American population in the United States was about 140,000 people. Of those, 120,000, about 90%, lived on the west coast of the United States. Now, this wasn't particularly unusual. The Japanese American population simply hadn't had enough time to expand outward. About one third of the population was still the immigrant generation, uh, what are sometimes called the first generation Issei. The remaining two thirds were their children, the second generation Nisei. But most of those were still in their teens or maybe early 20s, only just starting to get to the age where they were thinking about maybe settling down and starting families of their own. In addition, part of the reason that the Japanese Americans hadn't expanded very much is because the United States was not a very friendly place for them at the time. This was a period of intense anti-immigrant sentiment. It also was the period when the Jim Crow laws were at their height. So it wasn't a very good time to be an immigrant in the United States. And it especially wasn't a good time if you were an immigrant on the West Coast from Asia. There had been a long period of intense anti-Chinese sentiment that ultimately ended in the 1880s with the passing of the Chinese Exclusion Act which completely forbade any immigration from China. Unfortunately, a lot of that hostility was then simply transferred over to the Japanese American population. So it was already an uncomfortable time to be a Japanese American in the United States. And then you get 1941, December 7th, Pearl Harbor. As you can imagine, that really was not a good time to be Japanese American in the United States. Almost as soon as word got out about Pearl Harbor, rumors were flying that the Japanese Americans were conspiring with the Japanese Empire, that they were all spies or plotting sabotage. Now, anytime anybody investigated these rumors, it always turned out to be nothing. But there is a saying, 
A lie can get around the world while the truth is still putting its boots on. And in this case, that's pretty much what happened. There was a huge outcry to get rid of the Japanese Americans, including from the general in charge of the defense of the West Coast. Now, people have gone back and looked at the decision-making process that went behind this. And what they have concluded is that despite the justifications that this was necessary for the defense of the United States, there was actually no military necessity behind it. It was the result of wartime hysteria and racism. For example, when General DeWitt was asked to justify his argument that they needed to get rid of all Japanese Americans on the West Coast, this is how he answered. I mean, how do you even defend yourself against an argument like that? It's a catch-22. However, apparently the administration found it persuasive enough. President Roosevelt ultimately signed Executive Order 9066. This order gave the Army the power to exclude anyone they chose by any criteria from any area that they deemed militarily significant to the defense of the United States. A short time after that order was signed, General DeWitt drew a line on the map and began printing signs. What happened was that if you lived west of the dark line on the map here, and you had Japanese ancestry, then you were a target of these exclusion orders. General DeWitt defined Japanese ancestry as at least one great, great grandparent who was Japanese. So if you fit that criteria, about 120,000 people, then when these signs went up in your neighborhood, you generally had about two weeks to decide what you were going to do with anything you couldn't carry with you. That would include your house, it would include your farm, any equipment you had, your furniture, your livestock, your family pet. You had to decide if you were going to sell them or give them away or try putting things in storage and hope it would be safe or maybe asking somebody to look after it and hope that they would be honest with you for however long you would be gone. And then when those two weeks were up, you took what you could carry, usually about one suitcase, and you were sent to one of the assembly centers. The assembly centers were generally fairgrounds or race grounds, pretty much any public facility that could quickly be converted over to a holding area for a large group of people. Because when these orders went out, the army hadn't even decided where they would be sending all of these people, let alone started building the necessary facilities. Within a couple months, however, they had settled on locations and built 10 camps, concentration camps really, in the interior of the United States. Those are these dark triangles on the map. Heart Mountain was the northernmost of these camps. It was also the fourth largest. Over the four years that it was active, it had a total population of about 14,000 people. Now, it was never that large at any one time. Its maximum population at any one time was 10,767 people, which is a lot of people. And one of them was a young woman named Mary Oyama Mitford. Mary is the author of the letter that I read when I started this program. Now, we don't know why Mary sent that letter to the Powell Tribune, but we can venture a guess. In the weeks when the camp was being built leading up to the arrival of the first Japanese Americans, pretty much every week the Powell Tribune was running front page headlines like these. Now, if you're like me and generally only read the headlines, 
you might not even realize that the Japanese being described here are American Japanese rather than, say, imperial soldiers from Japan. And even if you read the articles, while they do acknowledge that these are people from the West Coast who have been living in the United States, it doesn't say anywhere that two thirds of them are American citizens born and raised in the United States. In addition, you'll recall that I mentioned that Heart Mountain's maximum population was 10,767 people. That made it the third largest city in Wyoming at the time. It was bigger than either Powell or Cody. And all of those rumors that were going around on the West Coast, all of that wartime hysteria, it was here in Wyoming as well. Now, Mary knew the power of rumors and panic. She had seen it in person on the West Coast, but she also knew a way that you could try to counter it. You see, before the war started, Mary was a journalist. She wrote an advice column under the pen name Deirdre. Her advice column was mostly aimed at young second generation Nisei women, and it largely focused on the challenges of dealing with the expectations of their parents, who were often more traditional, and the fact of being a young woman in the United States in the Roaring Twenties and the 1930s. Mary was very good at negotiating these challenges. She actually wrote a very funny article while she was confined at an assembly center talking about how the older Japanese couples were shocked, shocked, I tell you, to see young men and women out walking together and holding hands in public. So you see, Mary knew about cultural divides. She knew the challenges involved in trying to bridge those. But she also knew the power of humor and a friendly tone to cross those divides. And perhaps that is why she wrote that letter. Either way, the editor of the Powell Tribune decided he liked Mary's style. And so, starting the next week, Mary began writing a weekly article in the Powell Tribune titled Heart Mountain Breezes. Mary had a very distinctive style in this article. She was always very chatty and a very friendly voice, and she generally dedicated at least half of the article to just daily news about what life was like at Heart Mountain. She especially liked to include funny little anecdotes that would make locals to Wyoming smile, like the reaction of Los Angeles children the first time they ever saw a real live sheep, or a silly conversation between young women who had just learned for the first time that cows have horns. In addition to including humor and just a general friendly tone, Mary was always very careful to include personal touches, usually thank yous sent out to charitable organizations that had donated, for example, books for the local church or a flag for the Boy Scout troop to raise, or even just a friendly supportive letter that they sent in in response to her column. At the same time, Mary was not afraid to get confrontational, and she would often include space in her article for directly challenging, more contentious letters that she received. For example, while she was very careful never to actually call anyone out in these responses, she actually dedicated two whole columns, so two weeks in a row, to answering a letter from someone who she never identified as anything other than MVSJ. She also did not include MVSJ's letter, but if you read her response, you can get a sense of what MVSJ said. It was not our intention to express or imply a grudge. 
Although, of course, you can't expect people who have given up their freedom and surrendered all their civil rights, although they have committed no crime or single act of sabotage, to be perfectly, blithely happy in confinement. With you, we agree that all pioneers do deserve credit for their courage. But there is a great difference in the status of our parent pioneers and the evacuees. The pioneers were free American citizens who were setting forth because they wanted to go and of their own free will. On the other hand, the evacuees definitely feel that there is a stigma attached. They didn't want to be removed to places of safety, to be provided for by the government. They wanted to remain and to be allowed to serve as any other American citizen. So she wasn't afraid to get confrontational. In addition, Mary would usually speak up if there was a relevant conversation circulating in the regional or even national news. For example, in the first few months that Heart Mountain was active, rumors were going around in local communities that the Japanese are hoarding knives. They're plotting to sneak out in the night and cut everybody's throats. Now, the FBI investigated these rumors. Turns out that what had happened was over the course of a couple of weeks, some of the men who left Heart Mountain on work permits had bought pocket knives, about 15. Such is the power of rumor. But Mary never let those rumors stand. She was always careful to challenge them whenever she could usually by pointing out that the last thing the Japanese Americans wanted was more trouble. So, by being both friendly and by entering into some of the less friendly conversations going around, Mary made herself a kind of human touch within the Powell community representing Heart Mountain. She was a friendly face and a friendly voice and a person that people could feel connected to, representing Heart Mountain, rather than the Japanese Americans of Heart Mountain, simply being a distant, nebulous, and scary they. Now, there is an interesting side note to Mary's story. At least one historian has suggested that Mary may actually have worked for an American military intelligence service before the war. This is entirely possible. In the years leading up to Pearl Harbor, people knew that there was a risk of going to war with Japan. And so a number of agencies had been keeping a very close eye on the Japanese American community. This included the Naval Intelligence Service, the FBI, and even a private commission arranged by the president. And this is actually part of how we know that the decision to create these camps was the result of hysteria and racism. Because all of these agencies had been keeping a very close eye on the Japanese American community, and they agreed. Most of these people are loyal, and they will defend the United States if given the chance. Part of how they did this was by recruiting people within the Japanese American community, especially Nisei, second generation, like Mary. However, most Japanese Americans got their first contact with the American military service during the war, not before. Most people have heard of the 442nd. That is the Japanese American only military unit that served in Europe during World War II. Now, less people have heard about the Japanese American involvement in the military intelligence service, mostly because that was classified for a very long time. Many of these people were serving on the front lines in the Pacific front usually as translators and interpreters. This was a very dangerous position for them. Many of them were in danger of being shot by their fellow soldiers at, simply because they had been mistaken for the enemy. And they also ran the risk of being captured by the Japanese Empire, which would have executed them as traitors 
even though they never had any connection to Japan before. However, not everyone in the military intelligence service served on the front lines, and not all of them were male. Where Mary was a leader in reaching out to the local communities around Heart Mountain, Ruth Hashimoto was a leader within Heart Mountain. Now, for the record, her first name was actually Satoe, but apparently she had a lot of trouble getting people to pronounce it correctly, so she just decided to go by Ruth. And that is, in fact, the name that everyone knew her by, both before then and throughout the rest of her life. Ruth was the first of only two women to be chosen as block leaders at Heart Mountain. Now, a block leader was basically a community organizer. They were in charge of a single block within the camp and became the point person that everyone could go to with complaints or suggestions. They were in charge of organizing the block and also of representing the block in wider camp discussions or going and talking to the leaders of the camp, the directors. Now, this was actually harder at Heart Mountain than it was at other camps because the blocks in Heart Mountain were bigger. At the other camps, you generally had about 250 people per block. At Heart Mountain, it tended to range more around 400 to 500 people. So you can imagine what a challenging task that was. But Ruth was an extremely vigorous block leader. One of the things she's best known for is going out and making a survey of all of the food in the mess hall and analyzing the dietary content. What she found and reported was that the food in the mess hall made no allowances for the dietary needs of growing children or elders or people who might have special dietary restrictions like diabetes. She was also very much involved in organizing schools and also recreational activities, which were extremely important in helping people get their minds off of the situation that they had found themselves in. However, one of the reasons she was chosen as block leader was because Ruth was bilingual. She spoke Jap both Japanese and English fluently. This was very unusual for a second generation Nisei. Most of them barely spoke enough Japanese to mostly communicate with their parents. Being bilingual meant that Ruth could communicate both with the first generation Issei, some of whom didn't speak English very well, and the second generation Nisei, many of whom barely spoke any Japanese at all. This also meant she had an incredibly valuable skill that the American military really needed. And so, in June of 1943, she was recruited for the Military Intelligence Service Language School. Interestingly, according to her son, her husband forbade her from going. He believed that Japan was going to win the war. And if they did, and Ruth was working for the American military, then she would be executed as a traitor. But Ruth was determined to raise her children as proper Americans outside of barbed wire. So she left her husband behind and moved to the University of Michigan to teach Japanese at the Military Intelligence Services Language School. She only reunited with her husband after the war was over. Interestingly, Ruth continued to work with the Army pretty much her entire life until she retired in 1973. But she was always very clear. She blamed the war for what had happened to the Japanese Americans. And she dedicated her life to trying to make sure that a war like that would never happen again. One of the ways she did this was by arranging a sister cities relationship between Albuquerque, New Mexico and Sasebo, Japan. Her goal there was pretty much doing the same thing that Mary was doing for the Heart Mountain Camp, but on a larger international scale making sure that people of other countries had human faces and that you didn't have simply a nebulous they, but people you could think about. In addition, she taught a language school for Japanese immigrants. 
And when the citizenship laws were changed so that Asians had the right to become American citizens, which only happened in 1956, she taught citizenship classes as well. Ruth was one of the Japanese Americans chosen to go to the White House to attend the signing of the 1988 Civil Rights Act. This is the act that gave a formal apology from the American government to the Japanese American community, apologizing for what had happened during World War II. It also included redress, about $20,000 given to any survivor who had been in one of the camps during the war and was still alive in 1988. Ruth took that money and gave half of it to the Japanese American Citizens League and half of it to various charities who were working for world peace. In fact, in 1996, shortly before her death, she was granted the Living Treasure of New Mexico Award as a world peace advocate, which is a pretty amazing accomplishment if you think about it. So she had an amazing career after the camp. But she wasn't the only Japanese American woman to make an important name for herself following her time in the camp. Michiko Iseri also had a distinguished career after the war, but in a very different area. Michiko was the ninth of 10 children and she was known for her dancing. When she was four years old, her family had gone to live in Japan for a while and she studied traditional Japanese dance there. When her family returned to the United States when she was six years old, she continued studying dance. And in fact, she started teaching traditional Japanese dance when she was 12. However, she didn't just study Japanese dance. She was interested in the traditional dance forms from all throughout Asia. And she had a wonderful career starting right up until the Exclusion Act when she was sent to Heart Mountain and her budding career was suddenly cut short for a while. Of course, within Heart Mountain, she was quite popular. As I mentioned earlier, recreation was incredibly important simply to keep morale up amongst all of these people who had been confined based on their race. So people asked Michiko to put together a dance troupe. So she recruited a number of young women, taught them the traditional Japanese dances, and they even put their own costumes together. They would go around and talk to the older Japanese women who, were, who had immigrated to the United States and brought their traditional clothing with them. And then they made their own wigs and ornaments themselves from scratch. Then they would put together performances, usually working alongside bands at Heart Mountain. But Michiko still wanted to teach dance. So in October of 1944, she got permission to travel to New York where she had been hired as an assistant instructor at a dance studio. And it was in New York after the war that Michiko made her big impact on Broadway. You see, Michiko taught all different forms of traditional Asian dance not just Japanese dance. And in 1948, rumors started going around about this new musical called The King and I that was going to be starting soon. Now, Michiko herself wasn't really interested in this performance, but many of her students went and auditioned. And the choreographer of the show, Jerome Robbins, noticed that most of his best dancers all came from the same teacher. So he went out and recruited Michiko in person. You see, Michiko's big problem with the King and I was something that is called Orientalism. Orientalism is basically the attitude of, it's all Asian anyways, who cares? You can think of it kind of as if someone were making a movie about Wyoming, but oh, I like Denver too. Let's include a section about Denver. I mean, Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, it's all just West anyway, right? If you just twitched a little bit, then you understand how Michiko felt about this. 
Unfortunately, she had a lot of limitations in how much influence she had. She herself thought it was very important to be true to the dance styles of particular culture. She studied traditional dance. She felt that being authentic was very important. But, for example, at one point, Robbins told her that for one particular scene, he wanted something very sexy. Michiko's response was to look at him and say, there is nothing sexy about Siamese dancing. Have you seen what they wear? So instead, she ended up deciding that they had to include a Javanese dance instead. Despite that, Michiko ended up staying with The King and I throughout most of its production on Broadway, and she made a really famous name for herself. So in addition to pushing back even a little bit against the, oh, it's all just Asian anyway attitude that was common at the time, Michiko was one of the first Japanese Americans to make a big debut on the Broadway stage. And that was important because she was opening the door to other people to emerge onto the stage. She has also had an interesting revival of her legacy in recent years. In 2015, George Takei and several others put together a new Broadway musical called Allegiance. Allegiance is a musical specifically about the Japanese American experience during World War II. And interestingly, it is set at Heart Mountain. Before I wrap up though, I would like to go back to Mary. Mary wrote her article for 14 weeks after which she had to turn it over to someone else because she and her husband had gotten jobs, in this case in Colorado, and so they were allowed to leave Heart Mountain. One of the first things that Mary did after leaving Heart Mountain was she wrote a rather famous article called My Only Crime Was My Face. This was one of the first articles that really reached national attention talking about the Japanese American experience of these camps from the Japanese American perspective. And Michiko continued, <laughs> Michiko, Mary continued throughout her life to fight against racism in all forms, not just racism against Japanese Americans. But she also left an extremely important legacy behind here in Wyoming. You see, throughout World War II, Powell was always noticeably friendlier to the Japanese Americans of Heart Mountain than any other local community, including Cody. Historians have looked at the evidence, and many of them think that the credit for that friendlier atmosphere needs to go to Mary Oyama Mitwer and her Heart Mountain breezes, because she created that human connection between the Japanese Americans and the people of Powell. Michi Mary also wrote a really striking farewell in her last column before she handed it over, and I'd like to read that. Heart Mountain we leave with pleasant memories of the wonderful and magnificent sunrises and sunsets, the austere and rugged beauty of Wyoming in winter, the windy wind, the sandy dust storms, and the ever-changing views of the surrounding mountains. We pay a profound tribute to the early pioneers who first opened up this rugged country and better appreciate the things they accomplished and the hardships which they endured, having had a little taste of it ourselves after living in camp. In our first few columns, we try to present the Nisei Americans just as they are. Americans, just like you. Our plea is for patient tolerance, a sympathetic understanding of a difficult and gigantic task, constructive, not destructive criticism, and confidence in our American leaders. So thank you for joining me today for this look at some of the notable women of Heart Mountain. If you have any comments or questions, please feel free to leave them in the comment section on this video, and I will do my best to respond as quickly as I can. 
In addition, I would like to invite you to take a look at some of the new online content that Heart Mountain has put out in the past week and will continue to put out as long as the current national crisis continues. Thank you very much for joining me and have a wonderful rest of your day.